So a big thank you to all my patrons who support the Engine and Mind podcast. Hi and welcome to the Engine and Mind podcast episode 56. In this podcast we cover topics such as engineering, AI, neuroscience, life and other interesting topics and fascinating ideas to educate, inspire and engineer people's minds all around the world. I'm your host Yusuf and for this episode of the podcast I'm very excited to welcome Astrid Walle to my show. Astrid is a mechanical engineer with a PhD in computational fluid dynamics and more than a decade of experience in applied fluid mechanics. She has held several positions in gas turbine aeromechanics, R&D and AI development at Siemens Energy, Vattenfall SE and Rolls-Royce. As a recognized industry expert, she has recently taken on the challenge of starting her own business as a freelancer, following her professional determination to combine numerical simulation and data analytics. In this very interesting podcast, we covered CFD and data science, building an interactive post-processing dashboard with open source tools, getting into data science as an engineer, Astrid's company CFD Solutions, simulation data management, data science paradigms applied to engineering, as well as machine learning driven knowledge transfer. For updates on upcoming podcasts, projects and videos, make sure to follow me on Twitter as well as on Instagram. To join my weekly newsletter engineatmind.sh where I share exclusive content, visit yusuf.substack.com. And now, ladies and gentlemen, here's my podcast with Astrid Walle. Okay, three, two, one. So we are live. Hi Astrid, welcome to the show. Hi, hi Josef. So today we want to talk about uh, the two exciting topics of CFD plus data science and how we can merge these fascinating topics together. But before we jump straight into the nitty gritty and the exciting stuff, can you give us like a one minute bio? Um, who is Astrid and what does she actually do? Yeah, sure. Um, so or maybe at first, uh, thanks for having me. And I'm kind of excited and also feel honored to be part of your uh, podcast series, just like next two people like Wolfgang Gensch or Stephen Brunn. So that's really cool. And um, yeah, so uh, I'm Astrid. My background is in mechanical engineering and I did my PhD in numerics. And then after that, I worked for Siemens in the um, R&D for large gas turbines, mainly doing simulations for aeroelastics. And also there at that time, I got in touch with a data topic for the first time because we were doing a lot of geometrical optimizations and so generating lots of data. And at that point in time, I always had the feeling that we are not really making um, use of that to to an extent that we could maybe do this, but maybe yeah, we can discuss this also later. So then I decided to move more into the data topic and to start a career path in the data science. And um, yeah, so that was definitely a great um, excursion, so to say. I learned a lot, especially um, at my um, last posting I had at Rolls Royce, where I was mainly dealing with time series data, which is generated by the turbines, uh, uh, yeah, by the turbines during their flights. And um, yeah, but then also I already felt that I'm really missing the simulation part of that. And I always try to get projects um, together with the engineering and especially with the simulation departments. So there I was doing my first steps into topics like image recognition for CFD post-processing and stuff like that. And yeah, so then end of last year, I decided I really want to like devote my all, all of my time to the topic of combining simulation, optimization and data science. So um, then I started my own business and now offering all of these as a service. And yeah, so maybe I think I can close by um, yeah, bringing some buzzwords also into this. Like um, I feel really I'm on a mission um, to demystify and democratize data science and really close the gap to engineering because I deeply believe that engineers can do data science. Maybe they are just missing tools or the language to do so. And the other topic I'm really fascinated about is um, doing HPC in the cloud. So everything I do from um, simulation to hosting web service, I do in the cloud. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, so that's it. That's very exciting. 
thanks for the uh, for the introduction, Astrid. Um, maybe let's start very very easy. So data is of course a big part of data science, obviously because it's the name. And we had a lot of machine learning guests on the podcast talking about how hard it is actually to prepare data to make it feasible for um, machine learning or data science in general. How do you see it personally? Like you have a bunch of CFD data, let's say from an from a simulation. How would you organize uh, those data? How would you prepare them for? Processing. Yeah, so I think that is like really the basis for all of this. It's the topic of the data management. And on the one hand, I feel that um, simulation is already like the perfect base for doing data science because you have already all the data in an electronic form available. So you just need to make it accessible and um, yeah, and you need to know how to process it. So there's really about the data management. So um, what I always recommend when doing simulations is that you are using a kind of an automated process chain. So if you do that and you perform several simulations, you already have all the names of the directories and everything. It is um, predefined. So this helps you later on to access the data again. So it's easy to create something called like a data catalog so that you can easily really fetch the data after you did the simulations. And I feel that if you have done this and you have spent some time up front and really thinking about what data do I need to what extent or um, uh, do I need to store the data? So how much space do I have? Um, can I remove some of the large files up front? And if you spend some time doing that up front, then this will save you a lot of time afterwards and it will open up um, really a world of different possibilities to you because as soon as you have your data in a curated, organized form, then you can try all this fancy, fun stuff. Because, I mean, usually for all the data science projects, it's like, I don't know, 80 to 90 percent of the time you need to do some data wrangling up front, really thinking about, OK, pipelines, getting the data so that you can actually analyze and um, process it. And if you have this part of data wrangling already, then you can try a lot of stuff in no time. It's so much easier then. Mm -hmm. I see. Also, what comes into my uh, mind right now is I saw one YouTube video that you posted a while ago where you showcased um, what you actually built. Um, I'm not sure which tools you use, but maybe you can go a little bit into depth how you built it and how does it actually work. And I can, of course, link the video down in the description. Yeah, yeah, sure. So, um, yeah, so this this is um, this tool, what I showcased in the video is actually an interactive dashboard for um, viewing um, post-processed um, simulation data. And the use case, so the typical situation I had in mind when I created this is like you did a bunch of simulations, maybe you did a parameter study and you draw your conclusions from the results because, I mean, you're the engineer, you're the domain, uh, you're the domain expert. But then afterwards, you would have a meeting where you have to defend um, your results and your conclusions and you also have to explain them to other people. So usually what you would do is you have this meeting, you prepare different plots and you create slides and then you go into this meeting, you present everything. And I mean, really for sure, you won't have organized or um, prepared all the plots the people would like to see. So at some point in this meeting, someone will ask for seeing some correlation between two parameters and you did not prepare that. Mm -hmm. So then these kind of discussions start. And I mean, of course, we are all engineers and you have your gut feelings, so to say. So people have feelings like, yeah, okay, but when I did something similar some time ago, I got this or that result. And um, so then maybe people would not really trust the conclusions that you draw from your results because um, they would be afraid that you did not look at the right um, data, so to say. And yeah, I mean, gut feelings, emotions. So you can get rid of this all if you just have an browser-based interactive dashboard, which would enable you in this meeting that everyone can take a look at the data all together and it is interactive. So you can draw all the plots and all the parameter correlations um, what are asked just in that moment. And I feel this can help in really making data-driven decisions 
so um, that you overcome a lot of these discussions or that you would go into a revision, setting up a follow-up meeting. Then again, you would try to prepare more plots what people requested and so on and so on. Yeah, so that was like the use case or the situation I had in mind and really making this procedure of discussing results together, um, looking at them together, really making this uh, procedure easier. So what I did is um, I took an, as an example case, I took um, a parameter study I did in star CCM plus. And um, so I just varied, I don't know, I think like Two, two or three parameters um, for two different objectives. And then, so um, at that time I was using the Star CCM Plus Design Manager, which already does work for you because you can get your results already in a tabular form. But um, I mean, also before that I was using um, other process chains and as soon, or the only thing what you really need to have up front is your data. So parameters, results, objectives in a tabular form. And as soon as you have that, then you can use all the stuff from um, data science, um, what you want to use. So um, the starting point was really this tabular data um, where I had my parameter values and my result values. And then I extended this table uh, for some columns, which I used as a um, data catalog. So I just would po put um, pointers to um, image files or also uh, three-dimensional graph object files, which are stored somewhere else. But um, yeah, just, just use this one table um, as a results table and as a data catalog pointing to all the files. So inheriting all the data which I need. And starting from this table, then I was building this dashboard with um, Python and Streamlit. And yeah, so I use Streamlit because from, from what I have seen, that is really by far the easiest tool for um, at least making um, proof of concepts. So maybe at some point in time before you go to production, it's not the most performing tool, but um, yeah, really just for showing your results to a, let's say, limited number of people. So maybe it's not meant to be built for thousands of users, mm -hmm. but um, yeah, for, for that it was really great because um, with that I was able to um, have my prototype ready within a few hours. Mm, that's so exciting. So I usually or I ask uh, at the end of the podcast, what re resources do you personally use to kind of delve into the data science uh, topic? But could you give us like a, a little bit of insight? Of course, you have an engineering background, but how did you get into data science per se? Yeah, so um, so I really I really think for for me, the starting point um, was definitely the um, topic of doing um, geometrical optimizations. So um, where you then also would end up with um, tables um, consolidated from your parameters and your results and all these tables in, uh, in text form and um, as, as, as pure as pure ASCII text, um, text files. And then I like immediately started with Python. And since then I also sticked to Python whereby I have to admit that right now I'm thinking maybe I should um, move into the JavaScript uh, direction a bit more. But yeah, so mm -hmm. until, until now, um, it's uh, just Python. Yeah. What resources would you personally recommend? Let's say you mentor someone um, who wants to delve into engineering slash data science and combine those two fields. What would you recommend them to do? Where to go to? Maybe you have kind of courses in mind or books that you would recommend. Maybe you have yeah, some favorites. Yeah, so yeah, so, so what, what, I, what I have used and what I can also really uh, recommend is the uh, machine learning mastery from um, Jason Brownlee. Mm -hmm. So um, I think that's, that's really a great resource. And um, I also have to say that maybe um, just, just apart from, um, so the image recognition part is like the only thing um, I used which was not um, uh, covered to, to full usable extent in um, in the book. But apart from that, everything I use um, is, 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 in, is in his book. Mm -hmm, this is great. Awesome. Uh, could you also extend, like, let's say someone comes to you to CFD solutions, which we also want to talk about, because what is CFD solution actually? And they have a CFD problem. Like, what problems should they have? And what problems can you tackle actually with your company CFD solutions? 
Yeah. So um, yeah. So so with my with my company, I yeah, I'm I'm focusing on the one hand um, really on performing um, CFD simulations, and there um, yeah. So so because I did mainly uh, work in the field of fluid structure interaction, so that's also kind of problem what I'm um, really um, yeah good at, and um, so. Besides, besides of the pure simulation part, I'm really interested in doing optimizations because there I also feel that as soon as soon as there are clients who are interested in optimizing their designs or they also just want to explore the parameter space, then also the topic of data science is like a natural um, successor of, um, of, of these topics. And so I also feel that for some companies, um, maybe the topic of data science um, in combination with um, CFD is maybe too early because often it is also a different language um, which is used. So I feel that the topic of geometrical optimization and using simulation process chains um, to really drive this optimization this can be um, yeah, an, an, an opening topic for the data science part because then again, as soon as you have done an optimization or parameter space exploration, then you end up with a lot of data. And then you can make people more or better aware of what they can now actually do with their data to really make use out of it. Where do you see the biggest bottlenecks in terms of, let's say, someone comes to you, gives you a lot of data, what do you see that the bit, biggest bottleneck in terms of making sense out of the data that people bring to you? Um, yeah, actually, I feel that there, this problem um, is, so this problem is not present when people already have their questions in mind mm -hmm. but sometimes people they just they just want to jump on the train of some cool stuff and they do not really have their um, hypothesis um, thought really about that upfront and that is really important because you need to have a question in mind so that you can produce the answer so if it is too vague upfront so it's, but essentially it is also the same as with the um, optimization. So already for doing a geometrical optimization, we have to make this main thinking upfront where you just think, okay, so which parameters might influence um, my objectives and which, which are my objectives? So uh, which ones are really um, the results I'm, I'm most interested in and by what are they driven? And um, yeah, so, so do also do I have constraints? Do I have multiple objectives? Um, yeah, which would like end up in a burrito from that so that there is not only the one best solution fit maybe. So as soon as you have really this type of question, so where people really are looking for an answer to something and not just a feeling of, yeah, maybe let's do this better, but not knowing exactly what they are looking for. Mm, I see. It's also good that you mentioned this uh, high, kind of uh, high parameter space. I think also in your tool you use high plot, if I'm not mistaken, to kind of choose different parameter spaces. For example, you have a turbine or like an impeller and you want to have different parameters set and like a range of parameters. So um, yeah, that's very interesting. And uh, and as I mentioned already, I will put the video, um, the link to your video yeah. down in the description. So people yeah, can... maybe, maybe, maybe also about this multiple parallel access plot. Um, to be honest, that's also something I just um, came across lately. So I was not aware of this kind of plotting a few years ago. And I think it's really, it's really great. And also, for example, this um, these plots I integrated into my dashboard. It's a package from Facebook. So. Yes. Um, I did not do anything, so I just took it and use it, and it works just great because um, this actually really helps you in um, in understanding what is going on um, with your physical problem also. So with a physical problem that you are simulating, and when you really want to explore the parameter space and you want to find out if there are really um, a domain um, uh, dominant patterns 
So if you are just selecting different regions within your parameter space and you want to know if the behavior of these um, samples which you have run in this parameter space tend to behave similar. So then this kind of um, uh, high plot, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm a huge fan. <laughs> Mm -hmm. This is so interesting. Also, when it comes to, because you mentioned in the, in the beginning that you are a big fan of HPC systems, when someone uses your app um, and has like a, comes to you and wants to use your app, I think it's working in the browser, if I'm not mistaken, right? Yeah. So could, could you extend it or is it already possible to run, let's say, simulations uh, or parameter studies on the cloud or how does it work at the moment? No, so 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 right right now this kind of dashboard is a pure um, post processing um, thing. Mm -hmm. But of course, so for for my case, for my case, it was really that um, I was running the Star System Plus simulations in the cloud, storing my results data in S3, and then um, I could um, uh, fetch this data for the dashboard also directly from the bucket itself. Yeah, so it is. Um, As soon, as soon as you have this um, paradigm of a data catalog where you just use the pointers, then you can make use of all the data integration features which are available in Python um, by nature. So this is basically unlimited. So then you can have stored your data wherever you like. Mm -hmm. One thing I want to point out, uh, Astrid, is the big advantages of your tool. For example, let's say I do post processing or about C like in CFD, I would probably just drag it into Paraview or maybe I use uh, some other tools to post process my uh, plots. What is the big advantage of using your tool? So the big advantage is really that it is um, interactive. So. Um, for example, I mean, in, in, in terms of um, having nice plots, it is maybe not the not the greatest thing, but just if you have um, X, Y scatter plots showing um, the correlation between two different parameters, then in this dashboard, you are able to um, vary the parameter space you are looking at in this moment just by um, setting some sliders. Mm -hmm. So for each parameter which is available in the data set and which you varied in your simulations, you have a slider. And by that, you can reduce or extend the parameter space, which you just in that very moment want to want to take a look at. And I think that's the great advantage because um, usually you would do some plots, but this would just... This, this would be static plots, so to say. So um, you make a selection up front, then you produce the plot, mm -hmm. and um, you have no way of really um, yeah, moving some sliders and seeing, and by that, seeing the impact of your parameters onto your objectives. Because, of course, also in this XY scatter plots, you can, for multi-objective uh, multi optimization, you can also plot your Pareto front, and then um, uh, vary the sliders for your parameters. And so really see the points of the samples which were produced in that um, uh, defined parameter space in the Pareto front. And um, I just feel that this can help in really gaining more insights and understanding the dynamics um, of the parameters and their impact. Yeah, I think that's very interesting that you said, because especially when you go to a boss who might not have the experience of CFD in like colorful fluid dynamics, for example, like having a static plot is, is of course convincing, could be convincing. But I think if there's a question in terms of like presenting different parameters, how would certain parameters influence the design, for example, or the, the post-processing results? I think your tool makes makes absolutely a ton of, a ton of sense, actually. So that's that's very nice. Um, oh yeah, and 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 I mean, of course. So so that was like the like the biggest part for me, or the part of what make what made me the most happy um, of the dashboard was that I um, um, also included these interactive uh, three dimensional graph objects, uh, which I plot um, with using Plotly. So by that, this really also enables you to just within a browser to take a look at three-dimensional um, CFD plot results and uh, move them and drag them around, rotate them, zoom in. And yeah, so this is something where you 
usually would use a specific software on your machine and it's not really easy portable um, because yeah you would need the software and the data and um yeah so that um that was also something i was really fond of <laughs> yes uh, when it comes to cfd we, we also know about this kind of grid dependence study that you usually do is it something that's also integrated into your in in your tool where you could see like a grid de dependence study or is it something you do like pre uh before your tool yeah. Completely. Yeah, exactly. So, so, so this. I mean, of course, you could um, you could bolt on the dashboard onto the results um, of a grid dependency study, and then having the parameters for the time step size or um, domain um, cell size. So, um, yeah. So you could use it for post processing, but the results itself and the work up front, so the hard part, so to say, um, yeah, that's still up to you. Mm -hmm. I see. Excellent. So also one big topic we talked about before the podcast so that people don't think we we we, uh, we basically just came up with a topic is that you're a woman in the field of engineering and it shouldn't be like be worth mentioning in this in the sense of like you're a woman, you're doing a great job in what you actually do. Maybe you can talk about women in engineering and like encourage women who listen to this podcast to delve into engineering slash data science. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I mean, of course, just like everyone, I can just encourage people to really dive into these topics because, yeah, but what I can say from, from myself, I'm an engineer from heart with some data science skills. And um, so both both of these topics are just great. So, um, yeah, it's it's a, it's a great field for exploring. And I also feel that there's still a lot um, uh, to explore and a lot um, to do. So um, it's definitely not boring. And of course, from, um, from my experience, um, still this kind of working environment definitely needs more diversity. Um, that's for sure. And this will be positive in, yeah, just in various ways. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. I think I'll also offer people to maybe contact you on LinkedIn. So I'll just put your LinkedIn profile down in the description yeah, if there cool. any questions yeah. regarding CFD solutions, but also maybe delving into engineering or data science. Yeah. Um, with that being said, and we'll, we'll come back to CFD solutions if there are any more points that you have in mind, but I, th I think we'll now jump to the LinkedIn questions we got from some of our followers. Yeah. Yeah. The first question is from Krishna Vimpati, who asks, for developing an ML model, which is preferable for CFD, data in terms of image or data in terms of values. Typically, how many simulations are required to develop in a design um, optimization model? Assuming accuracy score of roughly 80% is good enough. Yeah, so I feel that this question is already like twofold. So like two, two, two separate questions at once. So um, the first part is, is really about the machine learning models. How many samples do I need to get, uh, yeah, a valid model um, uh, with a good accuracy and like the yeah what 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 he said like um, which which models would be best in terms of as data as uh, images so um, there's one one example where I can maybe bring up some ballpark numbers um, so um, if you have a classification problem so for um, one problem I looked at as image recognition in CFD post-processing, for example, was um, as a result of an automated post-processing chain where you would always end up with some um, plots, um, contour plots, and these contour plots then also tend to have the same levels and the same um, color range, so which is actually good and what is like needed then to apply the image recognition on these. And one, one problem, if it is like a classification and you just want to distinct between two classes. So uh, something like, okay, case with flow separation, case with no flow separation. So just having these two classes, then I would say if you use a CNN and you use a pre-trained model and just retrain it on your own problem, then um, I was gaining accuracies um, around 70%. Um, with 80 samples. So 40 samples for flow separation, 40 samples for no flow separation. 
And I mean, 70% accuracy does not sound great, but then again, it's about, okay, so what do you actually want to a- accomplish with that? And um, so what, what I was thinking of as a use case for this image recognition and CFD post-processing is that at some point, um, the domain expert, the engineer would still have to evaluate the results of the simulation to make a call whether the simulation actually uh, was successful and if the results make sense at all and if the design is actually valid or is as a good quality. And so if we can use then this pre-trained uh, or, or, or our, our trained model just by um, maybe filtering out the results which have with a high probability, um, either no flow separation or flow separation, this will just reduce the amount of samples and the amount of pictures this poor engineer has to look at. So uh, we will just free up some of his time. And yeah, so this is something what you can already gain also with a low um, accuracy. Very interesting. Yeah, so okay. So, so that was that was the case with the image recognition. So the second part of this question was actually, I think, more about optimization and surrogate modeling. And this, of course, is highly depending on the um, amount of parameters which you want to vary, the amount of objectives that you are looking at. And also, um, of course, um, it's depending on the complexity of your system. But yeah, also again, just maybe to give some numbers um, just to know um, maybe about the size. So assuming that you would maybe have like 20, 20 parameters to vary and you would have a multi-objective problem with two objective functions. So then I would start um, with the design of experiments with maybe 40 samples. And then from that, go on into the surrogate modeling and the optimization. And I feel that already after like, let's say 200 to 250 simulation runs, you are already able to get a, an idea of the defined Pareto front um, of your multi-objective optimization. Yeah. Could you expand this Pareto front just to clarify what it actually means? So that's just like um, your um, all all of your samples which you do the simulations for, and you would have the um, both axes dedicated to both of your objectives, and then bringing up the um, all of your samples on these axes. And usually in multi-objective optimizations, you really have so so your two objective functions they are not thriving towards the same direction. So um, the, yeah, so so you will you will end up with a front and then you have to decide yeah maybe also which of your objectives is more important for your case so stuff like this mm-hmm. yeah interesting thanks so much Astrid second question is from da- uh, Dania Mera and the question is I'm curious to hear what is your favorite application f- of AI in the field of CFD or simulations in general yeah so um, actually uh, Dania and I we um, we actually met during um, a women in data science meetup in Berlin and she also founded her own um, company now and yeah helping helping companies um, uh, making value out of their data and I was I was thinking about her question and um, actually the the answer to this is quite easy so what I really like, and that's also something what I incorporated into, into my dashboard, is the um, feature importance. Because I feel the feature importance is like a side product of most of the machine learning um, algorithms. So it's more like, yes, okay, so you, you train a model and then you also get the feature importance. But the feature importance meaning to know which of my parameters has the biggest impact onto my objective function. That is actually one of the main questions would would always arise in all the engineering problems. So you are always interested in gaining these insights if if you are performing or if you want to find the optimal design for your part, um, really to know, okay, which of my parameters is now really driving my objective towards the optimal result. Mm, That's very interesting. Cool. Next question from Arun. For someone just venturing out into this field, what are some strong fundamentals that one should have in data science and CFD? 
Yeah, okay. So I think I already mentioned the uh, machine learning mastery from Jason Brownlee. So I think that's definitely one resource, um, one resource you can go to. And so maybe maybe it's just for me, but um, I feel that the data science part is kind of doable to put onto the engineering skills. But the, to gain the engineering skills, um, really to get also some domain knowledge for the problem. So I always feel you need to understand the problems also to be able to make the data science um, for this. And there I feel, yeah, the engineering and also the numerical um, knowledge. So to get a feeling for the data, which is produced by the CFD softwares, that is also important. And this is actually something what only comes with time. So by gaining experience, um, doing simulations, running cases, looking at the data. Mm -hmm. Yeah, got it. Last question from Nitin. Um, how would one use available large amount of CFD data to feed in the ML model slash solution field in order to interpolate the solution and also use of CNN surrogate modeling signed distance function? Yeah, that's actually also a good question. <laughs> and um, yeah, so and, and, and maybe maybe this also um, comes together with the last one um, for which skills are needed. So um, doing ETL, so doing transformation, so uh, getting data in one form and then transforming it into another form, that is definitely also a really important skill. So um, you would end up with data files, result files um, from your simulation solvers, and then you have to make them readable for whatever data science tool you want to use. So, um, yeah, so one thing, for example, I, um, I was also doing is um, I was using TechPlot um, software. It's a post-processing software. So you can read in your CGNS files or also binary files produced by your solvers and then you can do some post-processing whatsoever. And then you can export it to uh, raw ASCII um, text files. And these ones, again, then you can also um, already define which columns you want to have and how the data is ordered in your files. And this, of course, is some knowledge you need to have before you start with, um, with the import into your data science tools. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. So that, that are all four questions that we had so far. Is there anything else you would like to talk about? Because you also have some points written down, right, that you maybe want to talk about? Um, yeah, let me let me check just to make sure that I yeah. So we talked about the simulation data management and um, okay yeah. So the topic of um, uh, I, I promised I would talk about this um, applying um, data science paradigms to engineering and this is also not something new but. Um, sometimes I just have the feeling that engineers, they get kind of um, afraid of some phrases which are common in data science. So when I say to someone, yeah, okay, so you should put your data into a database, then it's sometimes like, oh, okay. I, I don't know and maybe I don't want to know what, uh, what a database is. So um, here I also just want to encourage engineers in general, don't be afraid. And also, you cannot break anything. Just um, just try, and um, that the same with the databases and with the machine learning and data science in general. So I believe most of the stuff engineers are doing all the time. Um, so um, yeah, so of course they do some curve fitting all the time. So it's just different names. And um, just applying or taking some, some of these data science um, paradigms and applying these to engineering, this allows for some, um, I, I like to call it cherry picking. So um, why not use the best tools and which are the easiest for me to apply from engineering for doing my simulations. But then if I want to analyze the data, then of course I take some open source Python packages because they are so easy and the community is so big. So I can basically just Google the sentence or the questions, what I had in my mind, and I can just Google it and I will find lots of answers. So this 
um, is enabling me to do a lot more. Yeah. And so we have the paradigm of using databases and with this comes together, I feel also yeah, making use of data catalogs, data catalogs and data dictionaries. So um, I've seen too often in engineering that you end up with your um, hard disk full of data. So you have terabytes of data and then you do not really know um, which data is for which simulation because you did not really note it down and you don't have a data catalog and which is just a table listing all the settings you made for a simulation with a pointer pointing you to the right directory. And as soon as you have done this, this will make life so much easier for you because you are able to retrieve results and retrieving results is also um, making everything so much more sustainable um, because I had to rerun lots of simulations because I was not so sure anymore which settings I was really using for these results or where the results are stored for um, one specific simulation. So storing this data, storing the metadata, keeping track of it. Um, I mean, of course, that's not the fun part, um, but this will save you a lot of time and this will also save you to rerun um, simulations. Um, yeah, but at the same time, for example, if you want to be um, really neat and you don't want to um, and you don't want to use so much space, so you say, okay, I just keep the um, results data, so just numerical integral results and the settings and the metadata for my simulations, and if then at some later point in time I find oh, that simulation with this result, this was actually interesting. Okay, I don't have the result files anymore, so the CGNS or whatsoever, okay, I have all the data I need. I can just rerun it. But then it is a really um, specific task. So it is then really, okay, I need the result for this simulation and I know I don't have it anymore. So then I'm enabling myself to um, actually make reproducible results. And I think that's also really important for um, quality uh, management. Mm -hmm. Could yeah. you quickly just define what is metadata? So for metadata, um, typical thing is the version of your solver, what you are using, because there will be changes. And if you don't keep track on that, then you won't be able to reproduce your results. I mean, even sometimes it's just enough, you have your results and maybe you also know exactly uh, which were the uh, solver settings which you used. And then two years later, a colleague who maybe is new and he wants to rerun the case and you end up with different results and you don't know why. And then this can also help in, yeah, so to say debugging or really finding the root cause for deviances in your results. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Um, I think we also covered image recognition uh, in one of our questions, right, for post-processing. Um, yeah. We also have machine, learn machine learning driven knowledge transfer. Yeah, so I think that's also an interesting topic, uh, topic and this is, um, yeah, this fits also to this um, interactive dashboard. And it is actually something I'm working right now on for my dashboard version two. So um, let's let's reuse this example of the image recognition for flow separation for identifying flow separation. So um, you have already done, let's say, um, a design of experiments. So you have generated 80 samples and now maybe before you start the optimization procedure now, based on this design of experiments, you already evaluate the data, what you have generated so far. So someone takes a look at 80 contour plots mm -hmm. showing something, flow field, and he's looking for flow separation. Or maybe he's also kind of doing a classification whether this design in terms of simulation was good or bad. So then um, within an interactive dashboard, he, he would be able to um, yeah, draw boxes about regions with flow separation and label the data while he is looking at this. And while he's doing this or with his labeled data, you are then able to train a model and this model kind of inherits his knowledge. And um, 
So this is then also not only labeled data, but um, as he is drawing boxes around this, it is also something for another colleague he can take a look at and then he can see why this other engineer made his decision. So, okay, you can see, oh, so, so usually you would do this if you sit in front of, um, in front of the computer, look at the results. So it's this typical finger pointing. Mm -hmm. So they say, oh, do you see there, over there, there's flow separation. So that's the reason why that's a bad result. So um, you can do this um, then interactive in the dashboard. And then in the next, um, then for, for the next round, so we then start our optimization procedure and then again, um, evaluating the results from the optimization. Then we can already route our um, contour plots through this trained machine learning model. And then we can already tag the contour plots when they show up in the dashboard as a with a probability of X percent, this has flow separation or this does not have flow separation. So then you already give, um, yeah, you're already giving support for the engineer. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Where would you see, maybe to uh, slowly wrap things up, Astrid here, uh, where do you see like the perfect tool going? For example, you have your um, tool version one now you're working on two how do you see maybe version i don't know five or six or what would be the ultimate tool for you what's something that's very intriguing to you an idea that's very intriguing to you but maybe you don't have the time or maybe um, the capacity to build this tool yeah i think um that's maybe not um the really great idea um so to say but um especially especially as there are tools already doing similar stuff um, already. So if I think of, for example, heats, um, there you can do the simulations and then also do the um, analysis up front. It, it's not really interactive. So, um, but yeah, so to say, what 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 I'm what I would dream of is actually something like um, Star Cesium Plus together with heats, but bolting on some interactive features so that you can really dive into your results. And of course, it would have to be open source. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, maybe, maybe something like, um, like heats, but with open source. And um, yeah, so actually, I, I am also working on that part because there are also open source libraries, um, also in Python, like for example, open MDAO for optimization and design space exploration. So you can build your process chain, which inherits the simulation. So for producing the results, which you then can analyze. And um, yeah, so maybe bringing these two worlds together. So having the process chain um, built with open source packages where you then would just have to plug in your preferred solver and then putting this together with the dashboard for the analysis. Mm -hmm. Also, because you mentioned Star CCM quite often in the podcast, um, is it is your tool model ag or solver agnostic in the sense of you could use open form results or any other results? Okay. Yeah. Very interesting. Yeah, it is, it's, it's, it is really just a post-post-processing, so to say. Mm -hmm. so, but it doesn't need any any special data format in the sense of like when it's importing the data format. Um, yeah, so the, there of course is the um, uh, three dimensional graph objects for because I just use the Plotly um, uh, mesh graph mesh plot um, uh, capability of Plotly, and there you have to meet a certain structure um, field. But um, yeah, so also there you would just have to put some ETL process up front to um, transform your data into the correct format. Interesting. Yeah, that's so cool. And of course, as I mentioned already, I will put the link to your channel and also the video you have yeah. on your channel. I hope there will be more videos in the future. I think yeah, everyone yeah, loves yeah. to. I'm yeah, I'm planning. I'm planning to do so, and um, yeah, also, also, I plan on um, providing more um, to say snackable content because the video right now it's like ten minutes, and I, I myself find um, it's too long because um, yeah, ten minutes it's it's a lot of time, and yeah, so <laughs> yeah, it's interesting. I'm looking forward to see what's what's coming from you, Astrid. Um, anything else you would like to tell the audience where they can maybe find you? Of course, on your YouTube channel, LinkedIn. Um, where else can they can they find you? 
Yeah, so um, so LinkedIn, I think, is the best way. Then, of course, I also do have my homepage where I also um, uh, put my blogs. So I'm also producing uh, blogs from time to time. So I was also doing some um, blogs which are also featured on my homepage for um, TechLot software. And also when you want to know how you can get started with um, CFD and HPC and the cloud. So, yeah. Interesting. Cool. Anything else you would like to tell the audience, Astrid? No, I think um, You're I'm fine. good. Okay, awesome. Then thank, thank you so much for this podcast, Astrid. It was very insightful and uh, I hope people listening to this podcast will delve into uh, data science or maybe the engineering part, depending on where yeah. you are at your journey. Yeah. Um, and with that being said, thank you so much and I wish you an awesome weekend. Yeah, thank you so much for having me and uh, yeah, have a nice weekend to you too. See you soon.